go ahead and jump right into this. Um, just uh, some housekeeping. Uh, we are recording the webinar. That recording has already begun, uh, and we will be editing that uh, and getting it uploaded on our YouTube page. And for everyone that registered, I will make sure to send that link out uh, in a follow-up email. But first, I want to welcome everyone to our new web uh, a webinar series focused on brownfield redevelopment and downtown revitalization here in Kentucky. Uh, this series features a variety of presentations and panels, and we've had some great ones already, and we're planning some great ones in the future. But really, uh, what these webinars are intended to do are to help attendees learn about resources, get access to technical assistance, and hear some great stories about brownfield uh, redevelopment and downtown revitalization throughout the Commonwealth. So, in essence, we've designed these to help connect under-resourced and underserved communities to all sorts of great resources, references, technical assistance, uh, and, and speakers. Uh, but this series is one of many new uh, programs that we are offering in partnership with the University of Kentucky's Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky and uh, the Kentucky Energy and Environment Cabinet for Department of Environmental Protection's Brownfield Program. So today's webinar, The Long Game to Revitalization, it's going to feature two wonderful speakers, Deidre and Teresa, who we have on screen there with us now. And they're going to share the story of, of Beattyville, Kentucky's downtown revitalization uh, story. Really, it's, it's a long story. Uh, it's the long game, if you will. But they're going to be sharing how that story connects uh, to what they're doing now, but also how they're utilizing a nearly half a million dollar brownfield cleanup grant uh, to move their vision forward. So before we get into introductions, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, like I said, we are recording these webinars and we're gonna be making them available uh, on the SEDIC YouTube channel, but I'll be sharing those with everyone that's registered. But also I wanna, uh, I wanna invite everyone uh, to an upcoming free two-day Brownfield boot camp uh, that SEDIC and the State Brownfield Office is offering uh, later this month. It is a free two-day technical assistance program. You can choose your own track. Uh, if you want the sort of basics uh, to learn about the program, identify some resources and where to find data, uh, I would invite you to join us on the first day. Uh, but if you want a really more in-depth uh, sort of program that really talks about and, and thinks more deeply about how to prepare for some upcoming federal grants related to the Brownfield program, I would invite you to come today too. You are also invited to come to both days. Uh, it's gonna be held in Georgetown, Kentucky at the Extension Office. Uh, and if you would like more details on that, uh, please, please reach out to me, or you can go register at the link here on the slide that I'm sharing right now, all right? Uh, as we get ready to, to kind of launch into some introductions, I wanna remind everyone that there is a, a Q&A. Uh, you should have access to the, the Q&A box, the questions and answers. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please, please, please feel free to include those. And at the end of the presentation, we will circle back and try to get through as many of those questions as we can. And please don't be bashful. Um, if, you, if you're thinking it, please please ask us and, and we'll circle back to it, all right? Um, so let's, let's jump right in this. So I, I wanna introduce our two speakers today for the long game to revitalization. Today, we've got Teresa May, the Beattyville Main Street Director, uh, has been doing this Main Street work for a good long while, uh, has a lot of experience working in, in small communities like Beattyville, has spent a lot of time, like many people in small rural communities, she wears a lot of hats. Uh, so while she's going to be representing the Main Street program, I'm sure she's going to also be able to talk about other programs or other uh, sort of programming uh, that's been going on in Beattyville as, as they move forward. I'm also glad to, to introduce Deidre Brandenburg uh, from Beattyville. Deidre is the Beattyville and Lee County Tourism Director. These two wonderful women work hand in hand on a lot of work, and Deidre has been pivotal in building a, and growing a, a tourism economy. And I, and I just wanna give her a shout out today because she is calling from Louisville, from the State Fair, where they are currently promoting the Daniel Boone region and, and Lee County and, and all of the great uh, tourism assets in the region. Uh, so thank you for taking a little time out to join us in what I know is an incredibly busy schedule uh, for you today. 
So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. We, we have some slides that we're going to go through. I can't guarantee that we have all the pictures in the right order. So we may do a little bumping around. We also have a, a, a short video that we're going to share. A couple years ago, they put together a wonderful video uh, for HGTV when they were doing a hometown takeover series. Uh, so we're going to show that uh, maybe in a slide or two. Um, but I'm, I'm going to go to this next one. I'm going to open it up to you all. If, if there's anything that you all would like to add uh, regarding your introduction or, or who you are and how you come to this work. Would y'all like to share anything else about who you are? We do wear a lot of mini hats in our communities, but the best thing we have going for us is we work well together. Yeah, we also serve on each other's boards. So uh, I see I serve on Teresa's Main Street board and she serves as a commissioner on the tourism board. So we're in a lot of meetings together. We can share information on what all of our groups are doing. And I think that open communication is what really lines everybody into the same vision. Awesome. I, I think that's a great point. This sort of collaboration, right? And in, in small communities, we wear a lot of hats. And, and if we're not collaborating, we're missing, we're missing something, right? We're, we're missing some opportunities. Teresa, I don't know if it's your microphone, but I, I noticed that it was a, it was a little sort of garbly uh, coming through when you were, when you were talking. I don't know if maybe you got something covering it, or maybe we need to direct it to you. We'll, we'll give it a shot and, and see how that works. But let, let's go right into this short video. Um, I want to share this with everyone. Hopefully this will play and I'm going to uh, rely on uh, our folks in the audience to let me know if the sound does not come through. I've, I've, I've tech tested this, but I can't guarantee I'm going to I'm going to do my best that the sound will come through here. Long time. Neighboring the Red River Gorge, our county is growing. We have beautiful lodging opportunities, new small businesses, outdoor adventure tourism, including zip lining, world-class rock climbing, kayaking, and two off-road parks. From our impressive 4th of July fireworks display, fundraisers, fish fries, and tractor shows, to one of the most unique festivals in the entire state, at the end of the day, coming together is what we do best to overcome the hardships we've faced. Although the county is growing around us, our Main Street, the heart of our community, needs help. We have 18 empty buildings and they have challenges. Our community lacks the resources needed to address these issues with the blighted buildings. One building of historical significance to our community is what we call the WPA building. It is a beautiful building constructed of large cut stones, hand set in 1939 by the Works Progress Administration during the Great Depression. This building is in desperate need of repair. Uh, I'm Mitch Cornelius. I'm a Beattyville City Councilman. Uh, I've got a lot of fond memories of our uh, old city hall. It's an old WPA building. Uh, I grew up here in WPA all my life because my dad was on the City Council and he was mayor back in the 70s, so I'm really familiar with it and have a lot of uh, really fond memories. And I've got a, this is, this is a picture here of him and uh, his crew, the old fire truck used to sit down there and I know my brother and I, he would take us down there and we'd climb around on the fire truck and I, I just always remember my dad saying you, we, need to, we need to take care of our old city hall, our WPA building, that, that really uh, meant a lot to him and, and we're hoping that uh, HGTV will see fit to uh, assist us in, in bringing this building back to life the way it was when it was originally built. Downstairs was the water office, and the dispatcher lived up here. And there wasn't any prisoners here at the time. They'd been taken over to the jail. But we did have a dispatcher who lived here 24 hours a day. They operated the radios for the police and the county, anybody that had a call. Well, outside of it, with all that stone and everything, you just don't see that anymore. anymore. WPA built it, so that means it you know, ought to be saved and used for something. Yeah. 
And of course the water gets up down there and uh, there used to be a gauge down there. I can look at it, but there was a water gauge. You could read and tell what the water level was on the river. We have applied for several rounds of funding trying to get the building cleaned up. We know it's in need of a cleanup. There's been asbestos, lead paint, mold identified in the building and that cost a substantial amount of money to try to get cleaned up. As we learn today, the building's in dire straits. The roof is in bad shape and if we lose the roof, we lose the whole guts of the building. So we're in an urgent situation right now. My name is Nancy Bruningberg. I'm a resident of Lee County, Beattyville, Kentucky. And I worked in this building many years ago. I'm about to say my age here, but uh, I, I worked here for a while and uh, until they moved the city hall somewhere else. And I just, it just makes my heart just, whenever I see the shape that this building has got into, it hurts because I think about those old men, the WPA men, that put all this together. That uh, they do, they work so hard putting this building up, and it wasn't an easy task then, and I'm sure it wouldn't have been now. But you know, if there if there is anybody out there that could help us restore this building, oh, it would be so wonderful. It'd be preserving our heritage, preserving this building, preserving a lot of things that mean a lot to us as a community and we thank you for your consideration. I love that video. I, I love the ending. Uh, I, I love the fact that all of the kids uh, showed up uh, showed out and are asking for help. Um, but, you know, we, we can't tell Beattyville's story without talking a little bit about Beattyville's history. And this morning I, I, I did a little digging and I, and I found this uh, 1893 Sanborn insurance map uh, that, that shows sort of Beattyville situated right on the Kentucky River. Um, this is, I think, before the lumber mill or maybe about the time that the lumber mill was developed. But Deirdre, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the history. And I've got some historic images that that will sort of cycle through here. Um, but take it away. OK, uh, I've, I've learned a lot in the last, you know, two years, I guess, about uh, how Beattyville came about and why it was positioned in that certain spot and in the industries that impacted the area, because I'm also on the museum board. Uh, so there's a lot of people there. and and then learning a lot from the applications that, you know, Teresa and the city has put together. But what's really interesting about our town is, is the river aspect. Um, if you look right there, you'll see uh, where north and south forks of the Kentucky River meet. And really it's surrounded by hills. So the only logical place a town at that, you know, in the 18, you know, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s could be developed to be on the river bank, right where those um, rivers come together. And it was because of, of the natural resources that our, you know, Three Forks area in Eastern Kentucky offered to the rest of the state. So uh, they actually came in from Fort Boonesboro and got on the river and um, come up the river and got off here where the forks of the river came together because I mean, Lexington, Frankfurt, all the way down the river, they were desperate for resources. We had abundance of timber and coal and oil and things that they needed. So what it created for us is a huge influx of people wanting to work. Um, uh, I know a lot of people came from Virginia and a lot of people came from the bigger cities to find jobs and at the time too, uh, the Turkey Foot Lumber Company was like the third largest lumber company in, in the United States. And they, along with the other lumber companies in the area, um, would actually, you know, raft logs downstream. Uh, the picture you're seeing there is, you know, the coal industry. We had 
um, mountaintop removal coal, we had deep mine, uh, mining coal, and barges that would use the river for transport to get coal down to the cities that needed it. So really it was industry that that started to develop because when people moved in here, they needed schools, they needed shops, they needed grocery stores, they needed, you know, um, they needed all those things to develop churches uh, and people uh, flocked here. And this, I lo we love this picture. This is, uh, this is Christmas Eve. Uh, for a hundred years now, the Kiwanis, abatable Kiwanis have been giving away those Christmas uh, brown bag treats, you know, the one that you have the orange and the, and the peppermint stick and things like that. Well, this is a picture from at the courthouse, the old courthouse. Um, and that's just on a Christmas Eve, everybody came to town. So this, that was the feeling of community then because they, and the Kiwanis gave away those bags then too. So that's oh, kind of wow. how, you know, town became and it, 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 it looked a lot different um it was connected by a series of bridges i mean everything had to be filled in from you know river drive toward the river everything was filled up level to add more buildings uh, and then this building right here is very special to our community yeah, tell tell us a little bit about this building Teresa, you want to take it building is the Works Progress building, the WPA building, built in 1939. It's on our main street right here in New City Hall. Um, it served as our fire station, police department, and jail. Uh, Habitat for Humanity also leased the building to house people who would come into the community and volunteer to build new homes for people. The building's been vacant for several years, as you can see in the video, and it took a lot of wear and tear from the weather and also the flooding that we had, the historic flooding in 2021. Um, thankfully, uh, well, I guess HGTV, we didn't win that award, but thankfully Brownfield has come through for us and it's gonna help us restore this building. So I, I think, you know, th this image, we, we've got a couple other flood images and, and for, for folks, who may not know um, what has happened over the last few summers, honestly, in Eastern Kentucky is the majority of, of our communities have been impacted by flood events over a series of three summers. Uh, they were very, very substantial flooding events and in Beattyville, blessed with its location at the confluence of the Kentucky River, um, is also in the direct line of that high water uh, when, when these sorts of conditions emerge. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how that flooding not only impacted uh, Beattyville, but also galvanized a response and brought the community together, uh, really to, to come together and, and, and focus and support each other. But uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you all have been doing, Teresa, in downtown prior to the flood, kind of leading up to the flood, because that, that's kind of like a big pivotal moment. Uh, in, in the recent decade or so, but I know this story goes further. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the work that you all have been doing downtown uh, and, and kind of the challenges that you all have faced and, and, and how, how you started to address it and uh, some of the partnerships or programming uh, that have emerged from that. So seeing how the town was formed through the historic photographs and the story that we just heard, and we're going to move forward to 2006. Concerned about the decline of downtown Batable, city officials and citizens came together to form the Downtown Batable Alliance. The so DBA, now known as Batable Main Street, is an organization and also a department of the city that is dedicated to the revitalization of the Main Street Commercial District. Um, soon after it was formed, the DBA was certified and became a part of the Main Street program. And I'm a little bit hoarse. I've got a little bit of sore throat. So if I sound raspy, it's coming from, from me. <laughs> City officials and the DBA thankfully had a vision and looked to the future. They hired a Main Street director and together the city and the Main Street program applied for grants over the course of several years. We completed a three-phase streetscape project a few years ago. That streetscape project, a three and a half million dollar project an investment gave us a whole new look to Main Street that we're still enjoying today. Um, it gave us new ADA compliant sidewalks, 
underground utilities, new lamp posts, landscaping beds, a beautiful walkable main street that would be more inviting to businesses and tourists and something that the locals could be proud of. To us, the Main Street program has been an invaluable resource. Kitty, our state director, is a wonderful coach and cheerleader. She's someone you can always run an idea by or ask for advice. And you have this whole network of Main Street directors all over the state at your fingertips that you can call upon at any time. Uh, one of our favorite phrases in the Main Street program is rip off and duplicate because we don't care to share and be inspired by each other's ideas. So um, some of our goals of the North organization, uh, the Main Street organization, I can talk to you a little bit about those. They are to reduce the number of vacancies of the buildings we have on Main Street, uh, to do rehab and reuse of damaged or vacant up buildings. We do recruitment of new businesses to the downtown district. And of course, we support the existing businesses that we have. And we have a design of physical improvements to buildings and public spaces so we can look to the future and see how we particularly want things to look and share a uniform design of our main streets so that our businesses and buildings are cohesive with each other. Amazing. I, I, and I know communities that have the main street program um, they have a lot of they have a lot of resources, not just in what they can access with Kitty support, but also in the network of all of the other communities that that you all work with. Um, but one thing I, I want to kind of uplift about what you said is that um, your all's recent half a million dollar brownfield cleanup grant isn't a standalone effort. This is an effort that was really underpinned by years and years of dedicated planning, community visioning and responding and trying to create a community that you all know the locals love. And, and that's one thing that I often emphasize is that communities that can, can start to establish that groundwork and create their vision and know where they're going are often more competitive uh, when it comes to seeking out grant funding or other sources of investment. Uh, because it, it shows that, that you have come together, you're collaborating, and you've put in that you put that vision on paper, uh, and you're and you're working towards it. One of the one of the things that that I'm most excited about for you all is to see this new town square and the developments that are are sort of represented in these renderings we have on the screen right now. Uh, could you speak just a little bit about how how this opportunity came to be and and kind of what that process looked like or how long it took you all? to kind of get from idea to, to these beautiful uh, images that showcase your all's imagination? Okay, I'll talk for just a second. Um, it's a real tragedy to try a story. Um, the lot of the place that this town square is being built on was it had a building on there that um, housed three businesses and apartments upstairs. Well, a fire happened in 2018 and took that historic building away from our downtown. The city bought the lot, and after they purchased the lot, Deidre and I got together and worked with our boards, our tourism boards and Main Street boards and the city, and we put together a grant application, an AML grant application to build this new town square. We had often had the vision and talked about having a new park in the center of our downtown for our community to gather and um, a place for our farmers market to be and even in the concerts and, and just a place that our community could come together. And in 2018, we, we were awarded $1.25 million for the, to build this park in our downtown. Um, you you all are are quite successful at at getting funds uh, and and sort of implementing these visions, but I know you don't do it alone. Well, and, it takes patience because the AML grant it was we didn't get awarded the first year. We had to resubmit for a second year before we were awarded, and then the Brownfield grant. I mean, Teresa and the city, they submitted that grant four years in a row. Is that right, Teresa? 
I went back and looked. We attended our first Brownfield meeting in 2017 through our ad district. They got an assessment grant. So we went to their meetings and we looked at a building and talked about the WPA building, you know, vital to our community and anchor building on our main street. So we wanted that to be the focus of our Brownfields uh, cleanup grant. CRAD arranged for the assessment to be done in the building. We were turned down not once, not twice, but three times. It was our fourth application was, that was actually our winning application. So don't give up, ever give up. Persistence, no doubt, persistence and dedication to our community helped us win that grant. It, it really is about persistence and, and you all uh, sort of staying at it, not taking no for an answer. Um, and, and, you know, I always sort of, there's some P's that I love uh, and I always emphasize when it comes to downtown work and, and brownfield work. It's your partners, it's your plans, it's the programming, and lastly, it's persistence. Uh, and, and you really have to have all four of those. But before we get into uh, sort of talking about some of the, the successes that you all have had related to tourism and, and business development, <coughs> excuse me, we've got two, two great photos here. One, I believe, is of a, a, a leadership program. Is that correct? And then the other uh, is uh, the Main Street program. And, and it looks like it's an, a Main Street certification or award. Would, would either of you all like to talk about uh, sort of some of the efforts that you all have had in kind of regional collaboration? Because I think that these images really do represent some, some great partners, uh, both organizational partners and regional partners that you all have cultivated over time uh, in, in sort of this, this ecosystem of support uh, that you're a part of. Okay. I can speak a little about uh, Leadership Leap uh, if Teresa wants to speak a little bit about uh, the partnership, Main Street partnership picture. Um, Leadership Leap, uh, it's a program that kind of was um, established out of Estill County. It was just about Estill County, but then they they spread it out to include, turn, turn it into a regional approach. The funding for that leadership program come through a brushy fork, you know, grant funding um, and it really through this leadership program uh, Teresa and I both uh, attended the program um, you really reach out and you become friends and network with the people in other counties and out of this uh, program really we, we made a lot of contacts with people so like say for example the state fair I'm here in Louisville today uh, it's not just a Lee County booth. It's a Lee County booth, a Powell County booth, a Wolf County booth, and an Estill County booth. Um, because working across county lines and making those connections, uh, we all kind of promote outdoor adventure. We all promote the gorge. We all promote, you know, state park, our rivers, our recreational areas. So we, we've done regional efforts like that. We created a a guide for our whole area, our multi-county gorge guide, uh, and they're they're flying off the table, you know, today, uh, and the days that we've been up here. So that really helps make our regional connections. Also, you know, we're in an, another couple regional projects right now with the uh, the ARPA funding. Uh, there's a, the ARPA funding where um, you had had five. Uh, groups go in together to apply in order to to be applicable and we're in two of those projects um, so there's a moonshine trail project multi-tourism project and multi-county and city and also a wayfinding sign project with those same counties in the Red River Gorge area so and a lot of people have that where we maybe first were introduced or we first met was through the leadership program yeah. You know, it, it, it is, it's critical. Lead, local leadership is critical. And, and, and when we talk about leaders, it's not just elected leaders, right? Every, every small community that I visit, one of the first things I hear is we want to find a way for our young people to stay, for our young families. And these sorts of leadership programs are an awesome opportunity for young adults to get involved, to feel like they're a part of the community, to feel like they have a voice, 
to, to network and meet with folks in their, in their neighboring county or in their region, to feel empowered to create the change that they can imagine and to create those places uh, where they wanna be or where they want their family to be. Uh, so I, I commend you all, uh, all the counties involved in, in this leadership program because I know, and, and I've spoken to graduates of the program and, and everyone that I've spoken to, they always sort of uplift uh, what they've learned, how they've been energized, how they're motivated, how they have confidence um, to, to really tackle some of these tough, tough challenges that, that we're facing in rural communities. And, and I think the work that, that you all are doing, not only in your community, but as a region, knowing that we may not be able to get folks to stay for a whole week in Beattyville, but if we can get them there for a couple of days and hold them in our, in our adjacent counties, uh, we're serving everyone uh, better. Um, so I tell you what, this, this is a great transition. Let, let's sort of jump into some of the tourism gains that you all have made, because I think this next slide uh, really sort of shows the trajectory that you all were on. Well, let's let Teresa speak a little bit about the other picture. Okay. Yeah. First. In this picture is um, the Lee County Tourism Commission won the Statewide Partnership Award for Main Street this year. Fortunately, our Tourism Commission supports reinvestment into their community. They work with the city and Main Street to help with revitalization of downtown after all the tourists in the town today too. Um, so we are very fortunate in that aspect. We work together. Four of the people that you see in that photograph are on the Main Street Board and the Tourism Board. So we, you know, we communicate again, I'll repeat what Lisa said earlier, we communicate and collaborate. So we each know what we're doing and we work together and it's a success. And obviously because we won that partnership through the Main Street Program this year. So. Congratulations. And I think one thing I'll add to that is one of the most important words that you use in leadership is we. Yes, I'm the Main Street Director, but only because the mayor hired me. The city council supports the position. I'm surrounded by a team of supportive people who love their community, and I have great resources in the Main Street Program, Brad, KLC, aesthetic, you know, tourism, and many more groups willing to help our towns be successful. And why we make a difference, not I. So we is the most important word you can use in leadership. Yeah, I, I think I think you're exactly right. Um, we and and you all. I'm going to use you all because I want to defer, even though we're our partner, I want to defer to you all. You all are doing some amazing work. And I think this chart that we're about to show symbolizes really the effort and, and how it is, how, the, how you all are getting a return on investment, literally on, on the work that you all have been doing um, related to tourism and, and lodging and, and growing that sector and industry um, there in Lee County and Beattyville. Uh, this is this is about the only information we can track. <laughs> so it's hard to track return on investment. It's hard to track, you know, um, travel expenditures until you get the year late, you know, report from the state when it comes out. Uh, but this is this is based on night stays, lodging night stays. So we have a three percent transient room tax on all of our Airbnbs, our hotels, our cabin rentals, our, and now in January, the legislature, you know, added campgrounds to that, uh, mobile parks, if you park your, you know, Mercedes van somewhere overnight, um, uh, the yurts, the, the, the glamping tents, uh, all those things are included now, uh, but uh, we didn't, you know, the board in in 2012, the, the Tourism Commission was established in fall 2011, and, and they, uh, they graciously hired me. I, I love the story of my interview because I, the interview was out of caboose, you know, an actual caboose, and you walk in and there's this tiny, tiny little room in the back of the caboose with this huge table and people against the wall, board members against the wall were and, and stuck where they can't get out because it's so narrow and then um I remember because Teresa was sitting in the very back corner and there's no way she was getting out anywhere 
um so that was neat but um um, we didn't know whenever we first imposed the tax exactly how what was going to happen, how much you know we were going to take in from that, and even the first year surprised us. Um, but if you can see, you know, the growth chart speaks for itself. We've added lodging. We've it's just grown. Everybody coming into the area, taking uh, you know adventures and outdoor adventure, loving the cabin with a hot tub, and and you can see there in 2020, 2021. Uh, throughout COVID, people didn't just come to the country to stay in a cabin for a weekend at that time. With everything kind of shut down, schools shut down, people work remotely, they would they would come out from the city and get away from the city and they would stay a week at a time, you know. And then the cabins had that grace period where they would leave it empty, you know, after they left, they would leave it empty for 24 hours or 48 hours, then clean it. And then the next family would come in and stay for like a week or two weeks at a time. So that's that's kind of where you see that boost there. I love it. Tell, tell, us, tell us what we're seeing here. It looks like this may be what I would find perhaps at, at your booth today if I was to visit you at the state fair. Uh, yeah, um, uh, through tourism funds, through matching funds with the state and things like that, we're able to do a lot more publications, uh, get them into the rest areas and really promote our area. Uh, Geofencing is, is pretty big, really helps us drive traffic to our websites, like for events like the Bourbon and Moonshine Festival and the Woolly Worm Festival and things. So we've been really been able to get, you know, our, our pin to drop on Google on the maps because uh, of all the events and things and making sure our listings are correct on all these different websites. So that's that's really helped us a lot. And I'll let Teresa talk about the other picture there. Yeah. The picture is our new location for our indoor farmer's market. Um, in 2018, again, the Tourism Commission and the Main Street Program joined together to form our farmer's market. Um, we started as it being evening events as part of our downtown cruisings and concerts that we have. Um, then we saw an opportunity when COVID happened to move indoors. Um, a local building owner offered it to us to bring it inside because the farmer's market at that time was an essential business. So we wanted to provide that opportunity for small businesses to come in and sell their products, have farm fresh produce there, and then serve as a community outreach for people to bring information to hand out to the community. From that moment on, it's grown. Uh, last year, we had over 19 small business owners and vendors come through the market to be able to sell their product. Um, and this year, we're happy that we are occupying a building on Main Street that hasn't been housed since the flood. So uh, we're excited about that. Tomorrow, the Army Corps of Engineers is gonna be there to offer information about the flood mitigation study. So the community as a whole and our community leaders, the building and the mayor recommended that they come to the market because they see it as a great place for people to come to get information. So. It's, a, it's a great resource. And I think, you know, when we're thinking Brownfields programming, when we're thinking downtown revitalization, you know, one of our goals is how can we reactivate underutilized spaces, right? whether it is what you all are doing with the downtown square in that site of the, the burned down historic building or what it is you all are doing with the farmer's market and occupying this space in a vibrant way in a building that otherwise would probably be underutilized or even vacant. Um, so, I, you know, I just want to kind of uplift that because I think as communities are thinking about uh, these bigger goals, in a lot of ways, what we're really thinking about is how can we drive traffic humans uh, into these spaces and, and reoccupy them in vibrant, useful ways uh, that give back to the entire community. The market is also an incubator. Um, we have a, a neat success story with a vendor that started out at the market, and then now they are in their own building, you know, renting from a building on Main Street. So they ended up testing the waters and getting all the ducks in the row and then took, take that leap and actually uh, step outside the market to, to start their own, their business in their own brick and mortar uh, building on Main Street too. So that's really great. 
graduated the incubator and 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 now they're they're renting their own and I mean that that is success that I think every incubator a business incubator wants those sorts of successes. Uh, yes, I don't we don't mean to make everything sound easy because it's not. Caesar and I didn't have a clue as to how to run a farmer's market. So we've had to learn about all these programs, Kentucky Double Dollar, senior vouchers, and how to administer those programs. But we together with our board support and the city support took that leap of faith and signed the lease for that building, you know, and working together, we're making it a success. So but it's not been easy. I won't I won't pretend that it has. Yeah. Right. Uh, we've got a couple slides here related to some of your all's tourism uh, opportunities. Deidre, I'm going to let you sort of share about this, but I want to I want us to move through these fairly quick because I want us to get to the flood and then give us some time to talk about the WPA building and, and the Brownfield grant and how that all ties together. But um, tell us a little bit about what, what we're seeing here. I, I will say before you before you jump in that Beattyville hosts perhaps the most unique festival in the entire Commonwealth, uh, the video of these small children, the Woolly Worm Festival, where you can literally be a spectator or a participant observer, I will say, uh, for these Woolly Worm races. And if you have not made it to Beattyville for the Woolly Worm Festival, you're missing out. It is a Kentucky treasure. Um, that I, I just want to put a spotlight on here because it is it is one of the most unique uh, things that that I have ever witnessed and uh, I don't I didn't want to steal your spotlight but I wanted to to give you all a shout out because the Woolly Worm Festival is where it's at. Yeah, um, the, there's different. You have to go different avenues uh, whenever you're trying to do promotions and you can't just put all your eggs in one basket. You have to really spread it out. And what we found is working for us right now is direct to those user groups. So, um, for example, I mean, we'll get back to the woolly worm too, but um, say the the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway, it's user groups on a trail system that goes through our county that comes close to town. So the trail system, user groups for the uh, Ride the River Dragon, they're, they're motorsports. We've, we've had Porsche car clubs, we've had motorcycles, we've had Ferraris uh, on the highways uh, that's connecting the trails to town and in, out into the county. So that brings people through. Um, the trail systems like the Climbers Coalition owns a thousand acres of land here. They build their own routes there. We get about 30,000 visits from them. And we have information boards in the public parking lot areas in their recreational areas to try to tell them about events that are happening like the woolly worm festival the bourbon and moonshine festival the farmers markets open you know like come into town eat and dine to try to get information to get into those areas uh, something recently th uh, that's been happening is uh, the use of the auditorium at the at our high school there, there's a 500 seat auditorium that was underutilized for years. Uh, and then at the time, our one of our tourism commissioners had a vision and, and we, the tourism in Main Street City, everybody supported it and um, ended up being concert series of uh, uh, facilities used through the school uh, to bring in. And then we've had people come in for that from different states and different cities over for the different shows. Uh, and then, you know, even at the state fair, the most, one of the most asked questions is a woolly worm festival. What do you do? Deep fry them? No. <laughs> so no, we race them and you go, you race them like on the road. And we're like, no, up strings, you know, you have to show them the picture and, and everything. And kids just love it. And adults love it. And really the festival, it's been around quite a while. It's 36 years old this year. So um, and I really think our efforts in trying to show other people what we've got has been able to in, in make it better and better every year. I, I, I want to highlight the fact that um, when, when we're moving our communities forward and we're implementing plans and we're thinking about visions, we've got to have fun. This, this stuff can't be boring, right? Like 
no one loves boring. No one loves sort of formal and technicalities. And I think some of the stuff that you all, and this slide in particular, shows how you incorporate fun uh, to reach those visions because you've got these different user groups that are having their own fun and they're all intersecting in your community. And, and back to the Wooly Worm Festival, there is nothing more fun than watching kids cheer on the Wooly Worm that they think is gonna get up that string the quickest. Um, it is about fun and, and you all certainly know how to do it. Speaking of, you have some new things uh, emerging there. Um, that are that are certainly fun for for folks. So tell us a little bit about this uh, this authentic moonshine experience. And I've got another slide uh, with some more pictures that we'll pull up in just a second. Okay. You want to take it? Or you want me to start it off? Or? Let's talk about the Arbor Grant and the efforts there to get the funding for the trail. If you want to. Sure. Um, so Teresa and I, along with some. Uh, people in other communities and with Kitty Do Good and the Main Street program really tried to start um, talking about um, some kind of trail about moonshine to bring people that are on the bourbon experience, you know, from I-75 west to east. Uh, and um, an opportunity came up also, um, Moonshine Trail, that actual logo there in the middle um, was uh, already developed and taken by uh, a distillery in Winchester. Uh, so our, we got together when the ARP of money came out, uh, that, that third tranche of money where you have to have five different groups in order to even apply. Um, we ended up asked to be a part of that trail. Um, and really it, it's gonna launch uh, Labor Day weekend. So it's really close. And um, they're still printing, I mean, they're still printing the passports. So it's like, it's happening really fast. Uh, the funding is for um, getting the trail up and running, getting the, a media, a company to come in to film the different locations, get B-roll going, uh, do photographs, create a website, do the marketing materials. Um, and here at the state fair, people are like, oh, a moonshine trail. And the, they see it from like across the aisle or something. They've already almost cleaned us out of all of our information, our flyers and our rat cards about it. So, um, but this, what we have to offer is through Teresa and Donnie's experience with, um, with um, the Discovery Channel's Moonshiner show. So they were asked to be, I'll let her talk about that, but she was, they were asked to be a part of the show and they've made so many connections and now as a part of this trail, they've worked so hard to create this beautiful moonshine museum to be a, a bonus stop along this moonshine trail. So it's, uh, we've, we've been there, it's so pretty. It's, it's, everything is in a great spot. It's the experience to get out there is gonna be so different from people who are used to just popping in a distillery off of, them, off of how we, off the mountain parkway or off of, um, I-75 or 64 and jumping in and doing a distillery tour and doing their tasting, getting back in their car. I mean, this is an actual, you need to plan to have, have a half a day, at least. You need a half a day, at least just for this one stop. So it's, I'll let her talk about a little bit more about that, but I'm, I'm totally, I'm so excited. I already told her I'm coming over next weekend. I'm just going to stay over there in a tent <laughs> in, in, in the parking lot <laughs> next weekend when the trail starts. <laughs> You did a great job describing the trail in our museum. Um, the only thing I might add is we've advanced so far with technology and devices and things like that. The focus of this museum is to keep alive the old ways of doing things, the old ways of making moonshine. And after all, you can't have bourbon without moonshine. So I'll just add that. And we're honored to be a part of the trail. And we hope to promote the tourism aspect of it so people who come to the museum will also go to town and you know eat and stay overnight and then go on to the next stop of the trail. So we hope it adds you know something else to our community and impacts it economically. And and one one little thing I will add just briefly, you know, talking about kind of connections you all have made. Recently, I, I, I couldn't let the webinar go without sharing this. Recently, you all were attending a festival in Western North Carolina, 
that my brother from South Carolina was also attending and lo and as a vendor and lo and behold, I get messages uh, both from you all and from my brother saying, hey, I met some of your friends from Kentucky. They gave me an L.A. Uh, <laughs> so, so thank you all for keeping him hydrated. Uh, I, I know he, he appreciated running into you all, um, but I think it just speaks to the universal appeal, honestly, of, of what you all are doing um, and, the, and the traffic that I hope you all can generate. Um, you know, once this gets open and, and running. But you've also been doing other things. Um, and, and I'll speak to this just a little bit. Uh, you know, thinking about public spaces, you all have found ways to occupy public spaces. And, and what I mean by that are not only the built environment where you can see this beautiful car show taking place. I know you all have very uh, regular car shows and, and other events to drive traffic downtown for folks, but also the way that you all are operationalizing and leveraging your public assets, which the river is, is one of the most substantial. And I know you all have been working on a river trail and, and increasing access to the river, um, but I, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this. I would invite anyone to check that out because I wanna get us to another river impact uh, in, in the time that we have left here. And I wanna talk a little bit about the flood and, and then talk a little bit more about the WPA building. Um, but you know, this is this is a picture of, of the flooding that you all experienced, and and it is hard to imagine this level of inundation. Honestly, it's hard to even see if that top part of that that left or left channel wasn't wasn't in the image. You wouldn't know where the river started and the downtown began, other than uh, the rooftops. And and I've got another slide here that I'll show, but I, I just want to show this one because of it, it is dramatic. Uh, what you all experienced was heartbreaking, was traumatic, was dramatic, uh, created a lot of trauma and a lot of stress in your community. But I think the story that, that I want us to focus on is not of the devastation, but of how people came together uh, after the fact and, and what that meant for you all sort of moving forward in the last couple of years um, and, and sort of what experiences we may have, you know, what can we learn from from that kind of, of disaster uh, and what it means to our community and, and what our community means to us. Uh, so, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what the aftermath was like and, and how you all came together. I'll start. Um, I guess the first thing I wanna say is it created an opportunity, an opportunity for us to build that better. So I went back and looked at our messages, we text, our state Main Street director put it at 7.25 in the morning on March the 1st and said, our entire downtown is flooded. What should we do? She immediately responded and throughout the day we talked to her and um, you know, the city was taking care of, the electric was turned off, they're making sure everybody's out of the houses. We had a great emergency management response, police, local fire department, rescue squad. You know, we are very fortunate no lives were lost, the most important thing. Um, Deidre and I got together and started talking with Kitty and we decided to start a live local fund um, so that we could get immediate donations and start spreading those donations out to give the business owners and building owners money to do cleanup. You know, buy paint or drywall or cleaning supplies or whatever they needed immediately. So that Love Local Fund has been instrumental in the recovery and then also looking at long term how we could build that better. We looked ahead um, so we could offer later offer Ani grants and facade grants and um, buy some new benches for town and things like that. So the Love Local Fund has been, has been a wonderful thing. And I also know that um, the Foundation of Appalachia invested a lot of money in the recovery too and gave and supported to the business and building owners funds to help recover. That, that it, was, go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it is, it was a, a real experience for your entire downtown to be flooded. To come to town one day and every building on your main street be underwater. You can't imagine what that feeling is like. And one building that you saw in the picture was a little restaurant called the Three Forks Diner. That building had been vacant for, I don't know, six or eight years. This fella 
uh, poured his heart and sorrow in that building. He even lived there for about six months, restored it to a restaurant, fixed up the commercial kitchen, had all kinds of cute decor. He had been open for two months and the flood happened. He lost everything, no insurance. And unfortunately he hasn't reopened. So we lost some businesses, but I can also, you know, be, be happy to report that we've gained some businesses since then too. Yeah. It's a risk. It, it was really an all hands on deck moment, right? Uh, not, you know, not to use that cliche lightly, but it, it really was. And I know in, in our partnership at SEDIC with the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky and the Appalachian Impact Fund and James Graham Brown Foundation and the, the work that you all were doing with the Love Local Fund. Uh, I, I really want to believe that that our collective efforts were, were able to support a lot of people uh, who were really on the precipice of disaster and losing it all and, and kind of having faith, losing faith about, I just lost everything. What can I do? And and I know your all's Love Local Fund was was that boy. It, it, it helped uplift people's spirits. It, 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 it impacted their wallets. It impacted the bottom lines. Um, and, and, and it really is an amazing example of what a community can do when you love your community, right? When, when you put that together. Speaking of love, I, I, we can't end this presentation without talking about the love that you all have for the WPA building. You all recently received a half a million dollar cleanup grant. You've already shared uh, that it took multiple, multiple iterations uh, to get this grant approved, that you leveraged an assessment grant uh, uh, from CRAD, from your local area development district, to get that process started, that you were persistent over years of, of thinking about how to utilize and how to leverage this building uh, for what you all need. And, and really what I want to wrap us up on today, and then we're going to share a couple of the comments that were shared in the, the Q&A, is you know, speaking of you know, that persistence and 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 sort of working, now that you have achieved this cleanup grant, tell us how this WPA building, uh, how your all's plans for that building fit in with your bigger visions for your broad downtown development work and tourism and business development. What role is this building going to play in in the the efforts that you all have already started to see there in downtown and, and in in Beattyville at large? I think the first comment I would say would be the city owns this WPA building. So the city sets the example of how a building can be restored and rebirth. And, you know, we are grateful to Brownfields and all those who played a role in, in allowing us to make that happen. Um, we have a lot of visions for what that building can become. You know, it'll be up to the city to determine that. But Deidre and I have talked about using the first floor as retail um craft artisans and crafters showcase um back roads of appalachia maybe a welcome center for their trails in the community um it will be an anchor building for downtown so we have this anchor building our town square center and we have a developer working on another elementary school building on the other end of town so we have some real anchor buildings being developed downtown um, the second floor, we'd like to see maybe used as a, maybe an inn, a Main Street inn, bed and breakfast type of business. So we get people staying overnight. If they stay overnight, perhaps they'll look at a place to shop or eat. And, and we need more foot traffic and more people staying downtown. So we hope that the city sees this building as an opportunity to do that. Great. Uh, we, we have hit the two o'clock mark. Uh, and I know folks may need to leave uh, the webinar, but just, just before we wrap up, I, I want to kind of summarize a couple things that I've heard you all share today. And I, and I think these are important points for other folks who are thinking about how to leverage Brownfields uh, or the Brownfield program uh, in their bigger, in their long game to revitalization. And, and some of the things that you all have shared, I, I was taking, I was jotting down some notes here is that it sounds like collaboration is foundational, whether it is amongst your community, with your city, with your county, with other organizations, that collaboration underpins a lot of the work that you all have been doing, uh, in, in addition to your, your work with the Area Development District to kind of get this ball rolling, that you all have been incredibly strategic and innovative. 
with the way that you've approached downtown buildings with the farmer's market, using that as an incubator, graduating a business to create their own and, and seeing that investment play out, that you've really put value in investments in public, de public design and your public spaces and reclaiming spaces. Uh, you know, speaking of the, the burned building and the new town square and the investments, you all have really uh, valued and putting a lot of value in your, in your public realm. And, and what it takes to accommodate people who visit and, and experience your all's community. You've put a lot of time and effort in hosting programs and events, you know, utilizing that underutilized uh, auditorium at the high school for music events, bringing people downtown, connecting regional networks with the trails, the river trail, the, moon, the moonshine trail, uh, the back roads of Appalachia trail, that you all have experienced and exhibited incredible leadership, not only in yourselves, but in, in the leadership that you're cultivating with your regional partnerships with LEAP uh, and the other counties around you, and that you've, you've really uh, created some amazing plans. And, and you have initiated and began to implement them, those plans, including the work with this, with this WPA building, because you can't do this without a plan. And we just heard the, the vision that you all are shared and have, have started to create that I hope can also influence the city as the owner and how they may be able to best serve the community. Um, I think you've also shared about resiliency and community resiliency and, and in the face of a disaster, a natural disaster in your flood, how you all have bounced back, how you've came together, how you've created new programming with the Lo Love Local Fund that has been able to also support people moving forward after the flood. And, and, those, and, and that, that fund is paying dividends already. But lastly, I just wanna congratulate you all on doing all of this while having a little fun, because you gotta have fun while you're doing this and, and, and you all are doing it. Uh, so congratulations. We're gonna bring you all back uh, in a year or maybe two uh, once, once some of this work with the cleanup grant has started to roll out, we're going we're gonna to bring some of the other grantees together to talk about that experience. But I want to touch on a couple of the comments that folks shared in the, the Q&A. There weren't many questions, but there were some comments, and I want to make sure to, to get these, not only share them with you, but for other folks. Melody Knoll, a colleague of mine at, at SEDIC, shared, it's not a question, but a congratulations on bringing people together and increasing social connectedness, connectedness uh, with this in such a great way to improve community health, uh, mental health. We know that community cohesion, community connections really improve mental health uh, when we feel isolated. And, and uh, the, the disaster and, and our rural community struggle with connectedness sometimes and the work that you all have done to bring people together uh, really, really shows uh, an effort to, to, while you may not even think that you're impacting and positively impacting community mental health, you most certainly are by creating those spaces and places for people to come together. Tammy uh, Navarro with Kentucky Wildlands, I don't know if she's still on us, but she said, not a question, Deidre, but she wants to hear more about the Moonshine Trail and your plans for marketing. Uh, she'd love a brochure. It sounds like there may be a great opportunity to connect uh, and, and also amplify your all's voices with that moonshine trail through the Kentucky wildlands and the great work they're doing. I know when I drive around the region, I see their billboards uh, and, and I know that they are really championing the region as an outdoor destination. And then uh, Sonny, uh, Sonny Salyer also shared a comment here that he is proud to tell folks that he was born and raised in Lee County, and he's truly pleased to hear and learn of the programs, successes, and awards. Best wishes to you all. So uh, with that, uh, I also want to congratulate you on, on all the work that you all have been doing on behalf of SEDIC and the Kentucky Brownfield Program. Congratulations on the recent cleanup grant, and we are all looking forward to seeing what you all do uh, with the WPA building. I know I'm going to be calling and checking in uh, but again, before folks leave, I want to do another plug for upcoming Brownfield Boot Camp. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to myself. Uh, I will be following up with everyone that registered to send the recording, along with a couple other resources 
uh, over the coming days, uh, depending on how long it takes us to get this. But in closing, Deidre or, or Teresa, any, any final words before we wrap up the webinar? Uh, I'll say you never know what's going to happen next. There's a wild idea and we go, well, that looks fun. Let's try it. But it's never a no. It's more, let's figure out how we want to do it, but we're going to figure it out, you know, kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of how we, well, that's kind of how we've been rolling on a lot of different projects is, is, uh, is these wild ideas like those, uh, those uh, big animals, those, <laughs> I love it. Um, but we have kind of like Pikeville bears or those uh, horses from Lexington. It's like, let's get some of these animals. And, and we're like, great. <laughs> we don't know one thing about painting a mural on an animal, but we're, we're going to try it. <laughs> so. I can't can do attitude. Uh, Teresa, any, any final words here? No, just that we appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you, Shane, for all you do for our community and being a resource for us. Well, thank, thank you all. You, you all do the heavy lifting. Um, it's been a pleasure having you all on the webinar. Uh, everyone out there listening, all of our participants, all of our attendees, stay cool this week. It's going to get really, really hot. Take care of yourself, hydrate, um, and uh, remember, have fun uh, while you're doing this work and, and create those visions. Uh, we will be uh, having another webinar uh, next week. We're still putting the details together. We're running a little bit behind uh, with our boot camp coming up, but I will get that out uh, when we send, uh, send the recording. Everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, it has been a pleasure. And uh, Teresa and, and Deirdre, I can't wait to, to see, uh, see where this WPA building goes. Congratulations again. Thank you. You all take care.